Ok, we are live. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for my one Paleobot videos, Paleobotany and Paleo Knowledge for everybody. Today, I have a pleasure to receive here Dr. Padripe Sirivastava, a very important scientist in India. And uh, I will talk to you about some things about Dr. Padrip. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Hello. Oh, hello. Are you listening, Dr. Padrip? Yes, yes, yes. You are audible. Okay. okay. So, Dr. Dr. Padrip is associate professor in Department of Botany in University of Alabahad. Okay, and uh, yeah. he takes his graduation in our university, master degree in Alabahad University, and a PhD in Alabahad University also. Okay, he okay. studied okay. bot botany during long time, and uh, yeah. nowadays he continues. So, Dr. Padrip, thank you very much for you here. Please, you introduce yourself uh, now, okay? You detail more about your experience, about your curriculum, about these things. So, please, okay. you... Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Dr. Pradeep Srivastava, Associate Dr. Professor and ex-head department of Botany, Ewing Christian College, University of Allahabad. I have done my doctoral work under the eminent paleobotanist Professor D.D. Pant of Allahabad University and I have visited a large number of localities regarding the lower Gondwana and pre-Gondwana fossils of India, starting from Kashmir, West Bengal, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, etc. And I have approximately 40 years experience of working on the paleozoic fossils and teaching botany to PG and UG students. And, uh, I am thankful to Sarah for inviting me to deliver this talk on pteridophytes through the ages. As far as the topic is concerned, it is a very interesting topic and uh, it has originated from two words, tyron and phyta. These are Greek terms. Tyron refers to wing or feather and phyta means plant. So pteridophytes are plants with feather-like leaves. There are many plants which do not have feather-like leaves, but their life cycle is like the plants which are having feather-like leaves, and those plants are called fern. So uh, I will be going in detail about the morphological and ecological amplitude and then uh, fossil history. Okay, okay, Dr. Padrip. So you can you can start your presentation now, okay? And okay, as I told okay. you before, after presentation, people will ask, okay? And this presentation will be recorded, and after, we can share it, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. So, I begin now. Okay, let me put here. As I told you that pteridophytes are generally feather-like plants, and we call them as ferns, and there are many plants we do not have feather-like leaves, but their life cycle is like the ferns. You can see in this picture, here is a frond showing sarcinate vernation in young stage. And these are the pinnately compound leaves. And here you can see the presence of sporangia and fertile part on the abaxial surface of the leaves. Here I introduce you with my professor D.D. Pant, who was my doctoral guide. And I did my doctorate under renowned paleobotanist Professor D.D. Pant. He was authority on Glossopteris flora and cycads. This is Professor Pant's group. In the middle, you can see Professor Pant in dark glasses. On his left is myself. On his right is Professor D.D. Nautial, his first and senior most student. I happen to be his youngest student. He is no more. And this is Professor P.K. Khare, Professor D.R. Mishra, Professor Nupur Bhamik, who have worked on the fossil pteridophytes, fossil gymnosperms, and fossil bryophytes. And this is Professor Zhu from China when he visited Allahabad University in exchange with it. And this is Professor G.K. Shoastwa on my right, who has done a lot of work on the fossil plants and also on the living isoites, the quillwort. On my left is Sara. 
I invited her to Allahabad University and Ewing Christian College. I she met me in Birbal Sahni Institute of Paleo Botany in 2013, and on my invitation, she came to Allahabad, and we had a good time there, and she delivered a lot of a number of lectures, and we interacted with us. Now you can see the systematic position of pteridophytes in the Eichler classification. In this classification, Eichler divided plant kingdom into two sub kingdoms: cryptogamy. And phanerogamy and pteridophyta is included under cryptogamy and phanerogamy includes gymnosperms and angiosperms and these are the seed bearing plants. They are member of a spermatophyta and from bryophyta onward, bryophyta, pteridophyta, gymnosperms, angiosperms, they are land plants. But under cryptogamy, it is only the pteridophyta which has vasculature and but it uh, pteridophyta do not have uh, seeds. While gymnosperms have naked seeds and angiosperms have seed within the fruit. Now, these are some of the designations which are used for pteridophytes. We call them as ferns and fern allies, means plants which are fern-like, typical ferns and the plants which are fern-like, on the basis of their similar life cycle. We also call them as vascular cryptogams because cryptogams are plants which are having hidden sex organs, and among these. Pteridophytes have vasculature, means xylem and phloem. Other cryptogamic plants do not have xylem and phloem, like algae, fungi, and bryophyta. They are devoid of vasculature. Now, we also call them as primitive or early vascular land plants. They are also referred as seedless vascular plants because among the vascular plants, it is only the pteridophytes which are without, which are they are devoid of seeds. No seeds are there. Now. I will introduce you with salient features of pteridophyte. The main plant body of pteridophytes is sporophytic. It is generally differentiated into root, stem, and leaves. There are some exceptions. In primitive organization, the plants are rootless and leafless. The stem is photosynthetic. Examples are Rhinia, Coxonia, Xylophyton, etc. They are all fossils. Now, land plant characters. All the pteridophytes show land plant characters. According to W. G. Chaloner, there are three fundamental land plant characters: vasculature, cuticle, and stomata. Vasculature includes xylem and phloem. Xylem for conduction of water and mineral, phloem for distribution of food. Cuticle on the aerial parts; it is a waxy layer which protects the plant from being desiccated. And stomata are there for gaseous exchange. These characters are well developed. Pteridophytes. Have xylem, but in xylem vessels are lacking. It is made up of tracheid fiber and parenchyma only. While in phloem, companion cells are missing. But there are a large number of pteridophytes, more than sixteen, which show presence of vessels like Selaginella, Equisetum, Caris, Caridium, Cailanthus, Adiantum, Marsilia, Regnolidium, etc. They show presence of vessels, and we have published paper on these. Pteridophytes show two types of characters. I, they show, in general, homospory. Homospory refers to the occurrence of spores of same size range. This is very common. And the plants which show homospory, they produce monoecious gametophyte, means bisexual gametophyte. Examples, living examples, Lycopodium, Teres, Dryopteris, etc. Now there are many pteridophytes which show heterospory. It means Formation of spores of two different size ranges: a small spores called microspores and mega spores, which are produced in different sporangia. They are called microsporangia or mega sporangia. Mega spores are larger in size. And heterospory has appeared sporadically in different types of pteridophytes like Selaginella, Isoites, Marsilia. And the heterosporous pteridophytes produce dioecious gametophytes. Means the gametophytes are unisexual. Either male gametophyte or female gametophyte. The sex organs of pteridophytes are in form of anthridia, the male sex organs, and archegonia, the female sex organs. Anthridia are sessile, and archegonia have their wall of venter merged in the tissue of gametophyte. Actually, bryophytes do have anthridia and archegonia, but anthridia are not sessile; they are provided with a stalk. And archegonial wall is discrete; it is not merged in the tissue of gametophyte. The male gamete of pteridophytes are generally multi-flagellate. 
they use their flagella for swimming but there are exceptions lycopodium and selaginella they have biflagellate male gamete in bryophytes biflagellate male gamete is common but in pterophyte biflagellate male gametes are rare as far as fertilization is concerned fertilization occurs by zygogamy and chemotaxis zygogamy means swimming male gamete performs the fertilization and chemotaxis means male gamete is attracted towards the archegonia by chemicals secreted by neck of archegonia and they require external water for the act of fertilization this is the discrepancy and uh, they could not make themselves free from the need of external water that's why they grow in moist and shady places the embryo formed by the mitotic division in zygote they may be of three types in pteridophytes either exoscopic or endoscopic or prone type in exoscopic the zygote is divided by a transverse division and the cell towards the neck of archegonia gives rise to the stem apex in case of endoscopy the cell towards the base of archegonia produces the stem apex while in prone type the zygote is divided by a vertical wall parallel to the axis of archegonium and any of the two lateral wall produces the stem apex prone type of condition is found in ferns okay the habitat of pterophyte is generally moist and shady places they are generally terrestrial but some occupy epiphytic and aquatic habitats also i will be uh, telling you about these now this is a cr gross classification of pteridophyta pteridophyta are generally divided into five divisions some botanists divide them into four divisions and i will introduce you the plants which are here in ranuphyta which are the most primitive group of pteridophytes which i told that they are leafless and without the root they are rhizoids and this stem is photosynthetic these are represented only by fossils like rhinia coxonia xylophyton and many plants are there banks has divided them into rhinophytina jostrophyllophytina and trimerophytina next is xylophyta this is represented only by two plants xylotum and massifteris xylotum is referred as wisp fern next is lycopodophyta this is represented by four or five living genera lycopodium selaginella isoites philoglossum and stylitis but many botanists merge stylitis into isoites and there is a long and very rich fossil history of lycopodophyta like lepidodendron sigillaria lepidophloios etc equisetophyta includes only one extant genus that is equisetum to which we call as horsetail or scoring grus and equisetophyta has rich fossil history and include calamites esphenophyllum anodaria etc polypodophyta includes ferns and there are large number of ferns like teris dioptris teridium adiantum blacknum angiopteris etc and this group has rich fossil history and fossils are represented by saronias trichopteris asansolia etc this is the consensus phylogeny depicting relationship of major vascular plant lineages you can see here lycophytes have been separated and rest of the pteridophytes have been included they are referred here as monophylites and along with the spermatophytes means seed bearing plants they have been included in euphyllophytes in the latest classification by smith and associates in 2006 which is based on morphology and molecular phylogenetic data of the extant fern and fern allies this classification believes in monophyletic descent of pteridophytes it does not include fossil members and within ferns they use the term fern for all the pteridophytes within fern there are four classes 11 orders and 37 families the four classes are xylotops xylotopsida equisetopsida maratiopsida polypodiopsida now i will acquaint you with the morphological and ecological amplitudes of extant pteridophytes means living pteridophytes you can see there are the primitive pteridophytes called by the name xylotum nudum and massifteris xylotum is referred as wisp fern you can see here photosynthetic axis dichotomously branched and bearing 
dry sporangiate synangia on the lateral side, subtended by small leaf like appendage. In massive terrace, there are bisporangiate synangia, these brownish structures, subtended by large leaf like appendage. These are primitive, they don't have root, but they have rhizoids. Now, in Lycopodiophyta, we have uh, Lycopodium, which are having club like cones, and so we call them club mosses. They are also ca called as ground pine because they are having needle like leaves. Actually, pine word is used for, for pinus, but the pinus plant, which is a gymnosperm, has large needles. In Lycopodium, we have a small needles, and the plant is on the ground, not a tree. It is a herbaceous plant. Therefore, it is called as ground pine. Another genus is Selagenella. Selagenella has spike-like cones. You can see here. These are spike-like cones. And uh, we also use the word peacock moss for Selagenella because their uh, branches are spreading like the feather of peacock. This photograph was taken in Botanical Garden of Singapore. Now, you can see the isoetis called as quillwort or melon's grass. And uh, they have got a cormos uh, stem. And these are the sporophylls, either mecha sporophylls or microsporophylls, and these are roots. This is philoglossum. The plant is famous to show neoteny. It appears as if it has produced cones in a juvenile stage. Reproductive maturity is attained in embryonic stage. We use this term in geology for axolotl larva. But in plants, and particularly in pteridophytes, we quote the example of philoglossum for showing neoteny. This is uh, another extreme. You can see equisetum, the horsetail or scoring roost, which is uh, either uh, showing aquatic characters, sometimes it shows xerophytic characters, their combination is there. And the plant shows articulated axis. Nodes and internodes are there. And the leaves are without chlorophyll. They are white, you can see. The leaves are fused at the nodes, and only their tips are free. And at the nodes, there are branches, and branches also show nodes and internodes. And on notes, leaf whorls are present. They, at maturity, they produce cone in the terminal position. And these cones are made up of whorls of sporangiophore. Sporangiophore have a stalk bearing a pelted disc on the undersurface of which sporangia are hanging. So these are referred as living fossil because they show combination of primitive and advanced features. And they show long fossil history. They are famous as a gold accumulator. If the soil is auriferous, if uh, if the soil is having gold ions, then the plant will accumulate them in micro quantity. Now these are ferns. These are ferns, pinnately compound leaf, looking like feather-like. And uh, this photograph was taken in Meghalaya, one of the hottest spots of biodiversity in India. That is northeastern part of India. This is myself, and this is my friend from Indian Forest Services, and we have covered various parts of India, starting from northern part, means Kashmir, to southern part, then eastern part to western part of India. Now, these are the smallest pteridophytes. You can see here, Ajola, which is a free-floating aquatic fern. In young stage, it is green, and there, is, there are two rows of leaves here, and at maturity, it shows a reddish-brown structure, and they are referred as biofertilizer because in the leaf pocket, anabena and nostoc, blue-green algae, they are symbiotic and farmers use them for uh, increasing nitrogen content in their field. Here it is didymoglossum, which is also small, but it is epiphytic. It belongs to Hymenophilaceae and is an epiphytic fern. Strasbergen in his book has quoted this plant as the smallest pteridophyte. We do have tree ferns. Among pteridophyte in extant pteridophyte, the, there are three tree ferns, Scythia, Dixonia, Alsophila. And you can see here, this is Scythia growing near a uh, waterfall. And Saronius is a famous fossil tree fern. There are the other two tree ferns, Scythia and Alsophila. The maximum height is attained by Dixia in, uh, Dixonia Antarctica, that is 18.5 uh, meters. And you can compare the height. This is the car is standing here, and this is also fill other tree fern. Pteridophytes also grow as epiphytes. You can see th this is Lycopodium phlegmaria. I have photographed them in cloud forest in garden by the Bay of Singapore. You can see uh, these plants are hanging downwards, 
and uh, that the peculiar feature is that their cones are forked they show forking in no other species this character is found this is a very common scene in singapore this is a road near east coast park of singapore actually singapore is a city in garden not garden in city you can say there are a large number of parks and plants there and the road side they have beautified their city very much and uh, this is a common scene this is a angiospermic tree and on this you can see this bird nest fern growing uh, botanically it is called asplenium nidus it looks like nest of a bird so this is a common scene in singapore this photograph was taken in singapore botanic garden i am standing near the bird nest fern here this is asplenium nidus and this photograph is of sentosa island you can see two types of epiphytic ferns this is asplenium nidus and this is platycerium asplenium nidus to which i call bird nest fern and this is platycerium the staghorn fern there are two types of leaves the upper leaves and the lower leaves lower leaves are forked repeatedly giving the appearance of staghorn that's why it is called staghorn fern this is pyrosia simple leaf i quoted that it is having feather like leaves but sometimes they are not pinnately compound but the leaves are simple you can see here as in asplenium nidus so in pyrosia in this and all the epiphytic fern they show marimicophily they show association with ants and this photograph was taken in himalayas in nanital area this photograph was taken by me in western ghat in goa a very famous locality and uh, you can see these are the dried leaves they are referred to as uh, basket fern botanically they are called drineria rigida the same thing here but in himalayas i have seen this plant growing on the in the terrestrial mode you can see here in kosani area of himalaya the same plant drineria rigida is growing on the rock crevices now these are the aquatic ferns we have marsilia having cruciate arrangement of four leaflets on a long petiole and these are the sporocarp sporangia microsporangia and megasporangia are encased within the capsule like body called sporocarp this is regnerium diphyllum this is a brazilian plant and you can have an only two leaflets on the top of the petiole and this is pilularia only petiole is there no leaflet is there okay and these are attached to the soil in the peripheral part of the lake or pond and these two genera salvinia and uh, azolla these are free floating salvinia has bigger leaves but the plant is rootless the leaves are modified into root like structures and azolla is a smaller i have already told you that azolla is used as biofertilizer as it contains nostoc and anbina lugrin algae as symbionts within the leaf pockets yes ceratopteris showing the repeatedly forked front this also it is also a aquatic fern and shows presence of sporangia on the under surface there is the one leaf fern called acrosticum aureum which shows in marine habitat it shows in salty water and so we call it mangrove fern or leather fern this is very common in goa this is simple leaf fern called ophioglossum it is commonly called as adder's tongue adder means snake it appears as the snake has opened its mouth and the tongue is coming out this is spike these sporangia are arranged in two rows here and the very peculiar feature of this fern is that it shows highest number of chromosome among plant kingdom 2n is equal to uh, 1440 one 1440 you can say and uh, it is found in ophioglossum reticulatum okay 1.5k of most and uh, this is hemionitis it is having arrow shaped leaf this is also simple leaf and this cranny are born on the under surface of this leaf oh we do have very surprising climbing fern also to which we call ligodium you can see this rachis climber and these are the leaflets and fertile parts on the margin of the leaf and uh, this plant was collected from chandraprabha sanctuary near my city in rajmahal area in eastern india and um, jharkhand and also in front of the western part of india goa this is the team of my 
PG students. They visited Goa and they collected large number of plants of Ligodium and marine algae. So this is the collection of Ligodium from Goa. Pteridophytes generally do not show secondary growth, but we do have two exceptions among the extant pteridophytes. Secondary growth means the widening of a stem by the formation of secondary xylem and secondary phloem. In pteridophytes, there are only two plants among the living category, Botrychium and Isoetis. Botrychium is referred as grape fern. You can see the sporangia being arranged here like the small grapes. And this is quill word or Isoetis. Here, very small corm is there which is covered by sporophylls. They show uh, formation of uh, secondary xylem and phloem, but they are mixed and they are referred here in case of isoetis as uh, prismatic tissue. They do not produce voluminous amount of secondary tissue, very stable amount of secondary tissue means secondary xylem and secondary phloem are formed. Now, we do have pteridophytes growing as xerophytes. There are three species of Selaginella which are xerophytic. Selaginella bryopteris, Selaginella lepidophila, Selaginella rupestris. You can see the lush green upper surface of the leaves here. But when the habitat becomes dry, they show inward rolling and the abaxial surface of the leaves becomes visible, which is uh, pale yellow. And the tribals in that area, they collect the plant and they use as potency tonic. They are sold in fairs. But when these plants are again put in water, they be unroll and their green surface of the upper leaf, upper leaf surface is visible. And they say that as this plant has uh, become alive from the dead state. If you use this, you will also become young from the old stage. This is their logic. Now, generally, pteridophytes are neat, not eaten as uh, food or fodder because they have poisonous phenolic compound in them. But as you know, that man can eat anything by processing it. Uh, as you see in China, even snakes are eaten and crocodiles are eaten. Okay, so here, Diplogium squalentum is a, a, an edible fern. You can I have taken this photograph in a, a market, vegetable market of Himalayan locality, Nanital, and these are the young tips of Diplogium squalentum called as crozier. They are processed and eaten and cooked, and uh, people relish this in Himalayan localities. Now I take you in the fourth dimension, that is the dimension of time. And I will introduce you with the antiquity and evolution of pteridophytes through the ages. Okay, the early land plants they started uh, as the uh, coxonia. Coxonia is having the status of earliest vascular land plant, coxonia hemispherica, from the upper Silurian of Wales, and also reported from Devonian of Brazil, your country. And uh, you can see these are having dichotomously branched axis and terminally present sporangia here. They are almost spherical. And other plant belonging to rhinophytes is rhinia. You can see here the aerial branches are straight, dichotomously branched, bearing oval sporangia. These are found as uh, petrifactions. Two species of rhinia were established by Kitston and Lang. One was rhinia guinvogonae, that was the shorter species, having about 20 centimeter height, one to three millimeter diameter. It was herbaceous with dichotomously branched aerial axis. It was photosynthetic. Leaves were absent and there were adventitious small branches. You can see here. These adventitious small branches were profiles on the aerial shoot. When they became detached, they gave rise to new plants. The roots were replaced by rhizoids and the sporangia were terminal and smaller. This is the new reconstruction of Rhinia guinvagnae by Edwards. What is the peculiar feature? In this reconstruction, Edward has not shown rhizome. They have shown only the uh, aerial parts, which are dichotomously branched, showing adventitious branches, and very few sporangia have been shown. And uh, it is suggested that sporangia leave abscission scar and they fall. There is premature fall of sporangia at a young stage. And uh, adventitious branches also leave abscission scar here. This is another species created by Kirsten and Lang in 1919. It was bigger species having the height of about 50 centimeter diameter 1.5 to 6 millimeter. It was herbaceous. Aerial stem was again dichotomously branched and photosynthetic. 
leaves were absent, roots replaced by rhizoids, and the sporangia were terminal and larger, 12 millimeter versus 4 millimeter. This is a new reconstruction and new name of Rania Major. Rania Major has been renamed as Agleophyton Major by Edwards because of the lack of true xylem and phloem. They do contain hydroids and lactoids like bryophytes, and therefore they have been ousted from pteridophytes and they have been placed between bryophytes and pteridophytes and a new name has been given that is Agleophyton Major. A specific epithet has been maintained, but the generic name has been changed here. And you can see the peculiar character of rhizome which is showing arched and there is wide angle dichotomy of the fertile branches and the ultimate branches which bear sporangia they are small earlier it, it was shown to be large but now they have been shown to be small now this is the reconstruction this is the model of agliophyton major for the first time in paleobotany reconstruction of life cycle has been attempted by Taylor, Karp, and Haas in 2005. You can see, actually, in fossil, what is the discrepancy? We, uh, they are all dead plants, and we do not, we cannot study the ontogenetic stages. But by sequencing the stages preserved in the rock, we can reconstruct the life cycle as Taylor and associates have done here. This agliophyton major, showing arch rhizome and upright aerial stem, dichotomously branched, producing a sporangia on the short terminal branches. Now, this sporangium produces two types of spores. Also, they are isomorphic. Although they are isomorphic, they produce spores of same size range, but sexually they are different. Some spores are male spores. When they germinate, they produce this type of structure. And these are the upright branches which show funnel like structure at the tip. And here, male sex organs are born. Similarly, there are female spores. When they germinate, they produce this aerial branch and which are forked and at the tip again here sex organs female sex organ called archigonia are formed and when there is fertilization zygote is formed and zygote develops into embryo and embryo into the uh, agliophyton plant now these are the gametophytes this is linophyton rhinensis you can see all these Gametophyte, a number of gametophytes have been reported from Rhiney Church, a very famous locality from Scotland. They are all vascularized. They are having conducting elements and uh, they are having uh, mycorrhiza, means fungal hyphae are found. In Rhinia, Paleomyces fungi have been reported, which is mycorrhizic there. And here also, mycorrhizic condition is here. And the sex organs are born at the top or at the lower surface. This is Anthridia present on the uh, top surface of the linophyton, which was reported by Remy and Nemi, 1980. Are Rhinia, this is the gametophyte of Rhinia guinvogonae, called as Remyophyton delicatum. You can see here the sex organs at the top of the expanded tip of the axis. This is a table showing various gametophytes and their correlation with the uh, sporophytic stages. Say, Linophyton, which I had shown you, Rhinophyton rhinensis, is supposed to be gametophyte of Agliophyton major. Remyophyton delicatum, reported by Kerr et al. 2004, have been correlated with that of Rhinia guinvogonae. It is called to be gametophyte of Rhinia guinvogonae. Kitstonophyton discoides, reported by Remy and Haas, 1991. It is supposed to be gametophyte of Nothia ephila. Langiophyton machiae. Described by Remy and Haas, 1991, is supposed to be gametophyte of Horneophyton ligneri and Pseudophyton istine mani, reported by Schweitzer, 1981, is supposed to be gametophyte of Stachmansella or Uvania. All these gametophytes are generally unisexual, either male or female. Only Pseudophyton istine mani is bisexual, producing is producing archegonia in the center. And n 3 in the peripheral part. Even Schweitzer had shown germinating spores and developing sporophyte at the center of the expanded uh, disc where Archigonia are present. Now, other early vascular plants are included in Jostrophil Jostrophilophytina, and they are called as Jostrophilophytes. These plants are peculiar in showing sporangia in lateral position, and they start condensing the uh, sporangia. And a spike or cone-like structure is being formed here. 
and uh, they are they were dichotomous to pseudo monocordial branching and uh, ultimately they show ultimate branches showed sarcination and their sporangia bond laterally along the stem were sessile or on short stalk and they were globose to reniform in kidney shape and the examples are goslingia jostrophella sardonia ribuchia etc now the third subdivision was trimerophytina and the plants are referred as trimerophytes by taylor in his book and the their monopodial uh, branching was there and uh, they also showed trifurcate 3d branching and their sporangia were terminal like rhinophytes and typically fusiform to elongated and the axis with large diameter and centra xylem supposed to have given rise to all other vascular plant except lycophytes the examples are xylophyton trimerophyton pertica these are the examples 3d branching is there this is the landscape of devonian where these plants were growing you can see these plants were growing in swampy area there is a water body and in the backdrop there are volcanoes the sulfuric acid fumes are coming out and uh, these plants are found in rainy chert as a petrifaction and they have been worked out by a number of paleobotanists but i can quote that a, a number of new localities have been found where from devonian plants have been reported a very famous locality is zinhang zinhang fossil forest from zinhang in china and it was reported by wang and associate in 2019 it was about 419 to 359 million years old and the example is guangdi dendron this is a lycopod and they were growing as dense trees the height was 0.2 to 7.7 meter and they were bearing earliest stigmarian root stigmarian root i will let you know after some time and it is uh, starting in the devonian and it is present even in isoites which is extant like opposite they were monocarpic and dioecious mega spores have been reported the devonian forests in uh, 2.5 uh, 250 k square meter were found and they contributed greatly to co2 decline carbon dioxide decline and coastal consolidation another famous locality is uh, the fossil forest in svalbard norway and it is uh, approximately 380 million years old it was described by dr chris berry of cardiff university and professor john marshall of the university of southampton they were extremely dense with very small gap height was approximately 4 meter the, there were two types of elements pseudo sporangian trees small to medium showing some morphological similarity with the living ferns and palm and second was archaeopteridalian means progymnosperms trees with woody trunk in progymnosperm we get secondary growth in the wood portion calyxylon is very famous for showing secondary growth and the leaf branches probably related to living conifer like next locality is gilboa forest near new york eastern new york it was 390 million years old and uh, this has been recovered and the devonian period has a hugely transformational time for land plants evolving toward the forest ecosystem this is a reconstruction of gilboa forest and here we find that terrestrial vegetation of silurio silurian and devonian period was typically short and restricted to a narrow band along the water edge but in the middle devonian taller arborescent forms evolved with the cormos lycopsids cladoxylopsids and progymnosperm the elements found in gilboa forest are eospermatopterus about 6 meter tall related to ferns pseudosporachinus about 3 meter tall cladoxylopsid related to ferns tetraxylopterus aneurophytalian progymnosperm and labidosigeria which were about 5 meter tall they were mixed in gilboa forest now as far as lycophyta concerned we get seven orders of lycophyta drypanophycales protolepidodendrales lepidodendrales lycopodiales selaginales pleuromyles and isoitales one thing i would like to mention that in lycophytes we get two types of habit either they are uh, uh, herbaceous or they are arborescent or subarborescent and we get homospory and heterospory there are two series 
regularity and irregularity. Where there is ligule present, the plants are generally heterosporous. And where the ligule is absent, plants are generally homosporous. And I will let you know there is one exception. The plant is regulate. Leclerchia plant is regulate, but it shows presence of homospore. So now you will enjoy the beauty of Lycophyta. Drepanophycales, herbaceous habit. And you can see Drepanophycus here from the demon of Canada. These are the leaves and the sporangia are born on the adaxial surface of small leaves. This is the characteristic feature of Lycopod. And this is Baragwanathia longiformis from Silurio Devonian of Australia and Canada. These, it was very famous at a time, but now many plants have come. In order proto-lepidodendrails, we do have proto-lepidodendron going from Devonian to Mississippian. And they were herbaceous. And you can see Leclerchia, which I was talking about. This Leclerchia plant, herbaceous, axis, bearing, complexly fogged leaves. And the leaves we are having, these small ligules here you can see. And this is the sporangium. This is, it produces homospores and the ligule is also present, distal to sporangium. Ligule is present. Now, during lower carbonaceous time, there was Lepidodendropsis flora. It is supposed to be a worldwide, worldwide flora, Jong, according to Jongmans. It is a worldwide flora, including Lepidodendropsis, Protolepidodendron, Archaeosigillaria. Lepidosigillaria, Bambodendron, Pseudobambodendron, and Spondylodendron. They were not having any ligule. This is the reconstruction of Lepidodendropsis and this is Archaeosigillaria. I will show you more details. This is my work, particularly, uh, I worked on the early Carboniferous Lepidodendropsis flora from Kashmir Himalayas. And we believe that uh, there was regional variation in Lepidodendropsis flora. And we created a new genus, Pseudobambodendron, Chelonari, and Pseudobambodendron mayeri. There are the two species. And third is Pseudobambodendron fenestrata. The peculiar feature is that this is the leaf cushion, and these are the false leaf scar at the top. And here, uh, just below the false leaf scar, you can see a bladder-like structure. This is infrafoliar bladder. Here, here, and here you can see infrafoliar bladder. Then we go, I described spondylodendron, valeramensis. This is spondylodendron. The leaf cushions we are having true leaf scar, no ligule pit, and the leaf cushions were vertically fused, and thus the orthostichies became more prominent. Orthostichies means vertically prominent arrangement of the leaf cushion. Okay, here you can see the parastichies, but here you can see the orthostichies, and uh, this is lepidodendropsis. Yeah, even you can see the leaves coming out, and this was described by uh, Professor Pant and myself in 1995. The paper was published in Schweitzer Commemoration Volume, volume in uh, 1995 in Paleontographica. These are the more plants from the lower carboniferous of Kashmir. This is Archaeosigillaria, Lepidosigillaria. These are decorticated axes were also present. And we described them by the name of Noria and SPD area. Actually, I already told you that Jongmans 1952 believed that Lepidodendropsis for a worldwide uniform flora. But there are many workers like Rigby, Wakramiu, Chalonar. They believe in regionalism. And similarly, we also believe because we get some regional variation among the lower carbonaceous flora. And according to Lan Lanuzi and Pfefferkorn, it was a pre-glacial warm temperate belt in Gondwana, where these plants were growing. In Kashmir, we also reported decorticated caste. Actually, we got castes here in Valrama locality in Kashmir, Himalaya. These were found upper, in upright position and in situ position. These are the castes of stem bases from Valrama spur of Kashmir, Himalaya. You can see here. And they are all decorticated. The leaf cushions are not very clear. Now, the order Lepidodendrils. It shows arborescent lycopods and they grew in the Carboniferous landscape and they produced 70% of the biomass of the Carboniferous time. They were huge trees. Their height was approximately 40 meters and the diameter was approximately 2 meters and their root expansion was in the diameter of 10 meters. And uh, it is so because they were growing in swampy area and these roots provided a strong hold in that condition. 
and these plants the stem was covered by leaf cushion you can see here these are the fusiform form leaf cushion very tightly arranged and showing prominent para stichiasis means oblique lines i will let you know the details of the leaf cushion and the leaves of these plants are called lepidophyllum they were acicular long leaves and they produced stomata in the furrows present on the abaxial surface and these branches terminally produced lepidostrobus they were bisporangiate produced megasporangia and microsporangia on the separate sporophylls and under in which megaspores and microspores were born another plant is this is sigillaria which was sparingly branched and it was also covered by leaf cushion this diaphorodendron is the petrified state of lepidodendron and lepidofloyos had horizontally elongated leaf cushion while sigillaria had hexagonal leaf cushions i will show you one thing very peculiar about these plants is that they showed activity of unifacial cambium means the cambium vascular cambium was not producing secondary cortex was not producing secondary phloem it produced only secondary xylem and there was no secondary phloem produced by them and but the most of the bulk of the stem was in form of periderm periderm is formed by um, extra stellar cambium to which we call cork cambium and it produces what the inner side secondary cortex and outer side phloem and or cork and all these collectively these three layers form the periderm yeah this is the lepidodendron cushion you can see these are true leaf scar actually cushion what is cushion cushion is the is the outline of the space where the leaves were sitting on the stem appressed on the stem and this uh, rhomboid structure this rhomboidal structure this is a leaf base where the leaf was really attached and in the center of this this is the leaf trace here is the leaf trace and there are two perichnosis scars perichnosis scars were for aeration this is lepidofloyos you can see or gently elongated leaf cushion showing leaf leaf scar and here the vascular trace and two perichnosis scars and in these the peculiar feature is the presence of ligule this is the ligule ligule were present in a ligule pet so this depression is called ligule pet and you can see here sigillaria which is showing hexagonal leaf cushion and uh, here vertical arrangement of the leaf cushions are is more prominent while in lepidodendron parastichy means oblique arrangement of leaf cushion is prominent this is the basal portion of these lepidodendron trees which to which we call stigmaria cast and uh, you can see this very huge it was uh, gifted to birbal sain institute of paleobotany lucknow Uh, by the victoria park glasgow and there it was found in in situ condition a road was being built and when these in situ preservation of these three bases were found the project was changed and this area was preserved and this is myself in 2002 when i was there and uh, in connection with my research work and this photograph was taken by then this is placed in the reception of the birbal sain institute and this is that very famous and consist consistent anatomy of the stigmarian fequidius it is uh, from devonian till now you can see this is the outer cortex ts of the stigmarian rootlet this is the middle cortex where we get the air space and this is the inner cortex and here is xylem and phloem okay so this structure is consistent from devonian to the living plant it is also found in the carboniferous plants uh, like chelonaria and lepidodendron and even in the present day isoetis or killword this type of anatomy is present this show that the root structure was quite conservative these are the seed like structures of these uh, coal swamp flora plants this lepidocarpon and this madesmia we don't call them seed because they don't have integument this outermost layer which has been labeled here as i is not integument actually this is upturned megasporophyll and it is covering the megasporangium and this is megaspore with female gametophyte there is in situ germination of megaspore and uh, so because of, uh, the integument is absent and there is false surrounding false covering in place of integument there is upturned megasporophyll we call them as seed like structure okay and uh, you can see tentacles in myodesmia and here is ligule in sporocarpon we don't have ligule 
So it is the ovule-like structure, and when there is fertilization, ovule is converted into seed. So these are the two very famous seed-like structures called lepidocarpon and myodesmia. In myodesmia, we get tentacles and ligule, but in lepidocarpon, these two features are missing. This is a scene, landscape of Carboniferous time. You can see these are the uh, arborescent lycopods, and uh, here is a millipede. This is Calamitis, giant horsetail tree, and uh, these are millipedes, and this is Meganeura, a dragon. The wing expansion was about one meter, and a large number of uh, arborescent lycopods were growing there. And, and I, as I told you, that they had. Uh, Unifacial activity of the cambium and they produce only the secondary xylem, no secondary phloem, and thus they were able to contribute uh, about 70% of the biomass of the Carboniferous time, and they produce huge amount of periderm also. Lycopodials, these had herbaceous plants like Lycopoditis, Bambodendron, etc. Bambodendron also shows the presence of intrafolial bladder, but they have true leaf scar. Selaginellales, presently represented by Selaginella. There is a cone of Selaginella in LS. You can see megaspores here and microspores in other sporangia. And there are Selaginellitis, known from Triassic. And this is Selaginella porodendron. Selaginella frepontii are porodendron. It was reported from Carboniferous. And a good reconstruction has been quoted. Now comes Pleuromyles. Pleuromyles is from Triassic of Germany. The height of this plant was about two meters, and they were producing bisporangiate cones, and they were having uh, such narrow leaves, and they had four lobed rhizomorph and stigmarian type of appendage. So, stigmarian type of appendage is common feature everywhere. Now, these isotales starting from Devonian itself, and the height of this plant, to which the name has been given, Cleveland Dendron Ohioensis by Chitle and Pick, 1996. It is from late Devonian. And the height was approximately 1.25 meter. And it had monopodially branched spiral arrangement of the leaves, monopodial branching and a spiral arrangement of the leaves. Terminal heterosporous strobilus was here. Terminal heterosporous spiral strobilus was here. And uh, actually, Shia Chitle was originally Shia Shamla Chitle. And she shifted from India to USA and she changed her name. From Shamla Chitle to Shia Chitle. This is Chalonoria carmosa, carboniferous from North America. Unbranched stem, about two meters tall with carmose base. You can see helically arranged, small ligulate leaves. They were heterosporous, and the fertile region was approximately 10 centimeters long with micro and mega sporophores. They also show the presence of hysteric variant type of the anatomy of rootlet. This is Nathos Tiana from Cretaceous. It is found in form of cast and mold. They are having unbranched stem, less than 20 cm tall. Helically arranged root you can see here, originating from four lobe base. And the leaves were elongated grass like. So then comes the isoites. This isoites, the earliest known fossil, oldest fossil of isoites is known in form of isoites bistoni, which has been reported by Retelec in 1997. And its age was quoted at that time as Triassic. But now the age has shifted to latest Permian. And the another isoites-like fossil is Tomiodendron. It is also from the early Triassic of New South Wales and reported by Retelec. And this is isoites Janianus from the Bhuj formation of India. You can see the Cormos base and the leaves, sporophylls coming upward. Now, there is a very beautiful phylogenetic story created by Mac Defrau, 1932. He said that there was a continuous reduction from lepidodendron, 40 meter tall, to pleuromaya, 2 meter tall, to nethostiana, 23 meter tall, and then isoites, a herbaceous plant. This is a very beautiful story, but the story has become uh, slightly disturbed as Isoites bistonai was reported from Trisic, from here, where from Pleuromaya known, and now the age has shifted to early Permian. Anyway, such stories are formed 
and they become modified and new stories come this is what happens in paleobotany we have we are here to enjoy such stories you can see the comparative height of various carboniferous plants see lepidodendron then seen ceodendron diaphorodendron sigillaria bothrodendron lepidofloios and ultimately chelonaria you can see here now i come to isthenophytes the plants having articulated axis bearing world branches and world leaves they are classified into pseudoborneales represented by pseudoborneia isthenophyllales represented by isthenophyllum gononophyton chirostrobus lilpopia equisetales including calamitesi represented by archeocalamites calamites anularia astrophyllites lobet anularia calamostachys teleostachia Sarnoviaceae and Gononostachyaceae, represented by Philotheca, Ranigangia, Cyzonuria, Giridia, and Sacquarota, etc. And then comes Equisetaceae, represented by fossil counterpart of Equisetum, Equisetitis, and Equisetum, the only extant genus of this group. You can see here Pseudobornia, Arsina, Late Devonian. From the Bear Island of East Pitbazin and Alaska, reported by Schweitzer, 1967. They were having notes and internodes, leaves or myophils on the branches of ultimate order in superimposed tires. In each tire, there were four leaves, and uh, fertile branches were 30 centimeter long. Each fertile unit in the form of whorls of bracts supporting the sporangiophore. Stem was hollow. Notes. we are provided with diaphron this is arborescent hostel calamites it was given the name calamites thinking that it was a fossil of bamboo ba to bamboo we call calamus so a similar name was given calamites as equisetitis the fossil of equisetum so calamites the fossil of calamus but later on it was proved that it is not an angiosperm calamus is a grass belonging to gramine family poaceae family but it is it was proved to be a pteridophyte it was having node or internode world branches world leaves and you can see here secondary growth was there secondary xylem is being produced here and the beauty is that they were produced in discrete bundles and you can see here carinal canal which is a lysigenous canal formed by the destruction of protoxylem elements and this is consistent from the carboniferous time to the living equisetum carinal canal is present here carinal canal present near the protoxylem point in the vascular bundle and you can see secondary growth in these plants this is permian these are permian pteridophytes you can see here in form of isthenophyllum cyzonura philotheca ranigangia anularia lobet anularia and gononophytum isthenophyllum shows asymmetrical whorls of six leaves large leaves and small leaves actually isphenophyllum is a big genus and it has been split into four genera isphenophyllum para isphenophyllum rhizigia para rhizigia a japanese paleobotanist asama has uh, created these four genera but my group professor pan believed that it is it should all be included in isphenophyllum and when the fertile parts are known only then we can uh, split them simply on the basis of vegetative features it is not proper to split this genus into four subgenera or separate genera now cyzonuria is having two leaves two leaf sheath members at each node philotheca is having a number of leaf sheath members and they are few near the base near the attachment the ranigangia all the leaf sheath segments are few only the tips are free in anularia which is northern element in anularia you see all the leaves are free they are uh, lanceolate in lobat anularia which is again a northern element which i got in Pash kashmir along with the gondwana isphenophyllum speciosum it shows asymmetrical whorls they here the large uh, leaf sheath segment and here smaller at the base gondwana phyton having only two leaf sheath segments this isphenophyllum lobifolium variety of isphenophyllum which i have worked this is isphenophyllum lobifolium you can see a symmetrical whorl of six leaves and the leaves are lobed and an apical prominent notch is also there this 
इस फिल्म attachment of sprangiofore at right angle in paleostachia you can see the attachment of sprangiofore in oblique position and one more thing the cone of calamostachius was monosprangiate and sometimes bisprangiate paleostachia heterospora was heterosporous and it is reported from germany the spores and elaters of calamostachia beniana each had elater and has three three in number you can see these are the elateritis triferens it is each spore is having three elater now you can compare it with the spore of equisetum the present day hostel the spores are showing presence of these elaters and these elaters are formed by the splitting of axine and the uh, ends of these elaters are spatulate and they show hygroscopic movement in a wet condition they are wrapped over the spore and the spores are green they are having chlorophyll and in dry condition they become tightened and they open and they help the, in long distance dispersal of the spore by making a parachute there are the fossil cones of uh, equisetophytes in form of gridia the sprangiofores are appearing from the node this sarmastachus rajmahalia stachus and tulsi dabaria and this last one sacqua rota now i come to fern portion in ferns there are lots of variety large variety is there some pre ferns and early ferns in cladodolopsida and synopterid ferns then primitive fern like maratiales order is containing primitive fern in form of paleozoic compressed taxa and mesozoic maratiales then comes Ophioglossales. Ophioglossales is having Ophioglossum, Botrychium, Helminthostachys, and Manicua. And we fossil spores are reported from Jurassic and Cretaceous. Sterile and fertile segments of the Botrychium are known from the Paleocene of Canada. Then comes the advanced fern called Leptosporangiate fern, Osmundales, fifteen families. Then Polypodiales and Salpiniales. These are the early fern like plants included in pseudosporchenales from middle devonian this tree fern and uh, you can see a small tree 2 to 4 meter tall bulbous base and lateral branches ultimate branching unit produced pairs of ellipsoidal sessile sprangia this is pseudosporchenales another plant was eospermatopterus from the middle devonian it was 9 to 12 meter tall with massive fern like frond with seeds like seed like structures but these seed like structures were proved to be sprangia they showed presence of spores so no doubt it is a pteridophyte then comes synopterid ferns we don't get the uh, frond here only the axis is repeatedly branched and rachis is repeatedly branched and bear terminal sprangia and there are two types of species in storopterus storopterus oldhamia is homosporous and storopterus burntis lantica are heterosporous you can see these two big spores here these are reported by professor k r surange the earlier director of vibasani institute of phylobotany and lucknow and they were small bushy plants with paired branching xylem was four lobed sporangia terminal exenolate and apical stomium was there now you can ask why these were crept in fern when they were not having pinnately compound leaves the characteristic feature of the fern they are kept here because of the symmetry uh, similarity in the anatomy of the rachis these are etapteris and metaclepsidropsis the anatomy resembles the anatomy of modern fern rachis now a fossil tree fern called saronius which is reported from carboniferous uh, and permian it was about 10 meter tall you can see this they are the pinnately compound leaves bearing sporangia on the under surface of the pinnules and these pinnules are referred as scolicopteris the other sign in india present on the under surface of the fertile fronds this is the anatomy petrified structure these are the 
dictyostelic condition, polycyclic dictyostel is the peculiar feature of the foreign rhizome. You can see here the W seed uh, meristils which go in the uh, leaves and they a very beautifully preserved specimen. Now, as far as the Permian period is concerned, there were four uh, floras, Glossopteris flora, Gigantopteris flora, Rufloria and Garadium flora of Angaraland and Pigopteris flora. And uh, a large number of pteridophytes we are growing there is phenopsids and ferns. I have already told about the uh, is phenopsids and I, I will tell you about the ferns which were found in the Glossopteris flora of Lower Gondwana. Here you can see this is Asansolia phigopteritis, a picopterid pinnule and here at the margin we are present tetra sporangite synangia. Okay. Now this is Lycnopetlon rajmahalensis, a very peculiar fern which myself and Professor Pant reported from Rajmahal Hills of Jharkhand, you can see a wedge shaped leaf and bearing Esperandia at the margin here. It was earlier described by Anderson from South Africa, and we have created this new species here. Then Damodosaurus, CR solensis, and Trithicopterus gonorensis. Damodosaurus, CR solensis, this is Damodosaurus. You can see the sori, not synangia. Cluster of Esperandia. And you can see here in Damodosaurus, you can see the transverse annulus. And this is Trithocopterus. Here you can see Picopterid. This is Damodosaurus. And in this Trithocopterus, you can see Trisporangiate synangia. Here uh, they are showing fusion of three sporangia, but here is no fusion and there are clusters. This is Damodosaurus. Sphenopterid pinule. There are two types of pinules, pteridophiles. One is sphenopterid and other is picopterid. The earlier forms were present on the picopterid pinules and this one is showing sphenopterid pinules. And on these sphenopterid pinules, sporangia were scattered and they showed peculiar occurrence of transverse annulus. This is called Domodopterus polymorpha. Earlier, the vegetative part was known as sphenopterus polymorpha. So, Professor Pant and Khare described it as Damodopteris polymorpha. This is a very important work. It shows a uh, phyletic slide of annulus, uh, where Damodopteris has been quoted as showing the intermediate position. You can see here is Storopteris, which is having thick walled cells all over the wall and they were distal stomium. Then here is Botrychium, bo sorry, Botryopteris. It after is, it shows multiseriate vertical annulus here. Then is Osmunda. Osmunda showing unilateral group of thick walled cells. Then here is Domodopteris. Multiseries transverse annulus is present in the Domodopteris, also described by Pant and Khare. And here is Glycania showing uniseriate oblique annulus. And finally, here. Leptokylash is showing uniseriate vertical annulus. So the position of Damodopteris is in the middle position and through this transition has occurred. It was suggested by Professor Pant and Khari. Now I show you some members of Hydroptrangiate, the aquatic fern. You can see they are represented by Salviniales, including two families, Marsiliaceae and Salviniaceae. This Marsiliaceae is represented by Marsilio C. film from Upper Cretaceous, Regnal Litis from Upper Jurassic of Japan, Rhodiatis Dakshani from Sinojoic Deccan Intertrapian Bed of India, described by Sahani and Sithole, 1943, and Surangi, 1966. And these were correlated with the mega spore of Regnalidium. I had already seen Regnalidium diphyllum, a plant from Brazil, and the living counterpart. Now, Another family is Salviniaceae, to which Salvinia belongs. And in fossil estate from Cretaceous, Salviniaceous megaspores have been reported. Ajola, Ajolopsis, Salvinia, Parasalvinia, Ajola intertrapia, which is supposed to be megaspore from tertiary of India. This is the Ajola intertrapia, which was described by Professor Birbal Sahani, who established Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleobotany in Lucknow. Uh, and this was this is this work came in 1941. 
now the story of ferns is quite big and very rich and uh, i quote here rothwell 1987 and 1986 eleozoic gave rise to there were three major radiations of the fern first in paleozoic which gave rise to carboniferous forms then second radiation was in late permian to early mesozoic which gave rise to modern fern families and the third radiation was during late cretaceous to paleogene which gave rise to more modern families of the ferns so if we wish to go in the detail we have a lot of sources to go through like you can consult the book by taylor you can read the work by rothwell you can read the work by professor dd pant and uh, by the scientists from bilbo science institute of paleobotany and thus we can enrich our knowledge of uh, fossil ferns and now i come to the conclusion of my lecture here you can see uh, how the pteridophytes are fighting you read this word pteridophyte how the fight of pteridophyte is going on this is a slide showing the this mode of dispersal of spores and this boy is playing mischief actually what happens in dry weather this is this is annulus this green colored annulus the radial walls and inner walls are thick and outer walls are thin when they lose water the outer wall shows concavity and then overall pressure develops in the annulus and this pressure uh, causes the splitting of the sporangium wall at the stomium this is stomium thin wall cell a group of thin wall cells and this wall wall goes back and then it snaps back and when it snaps back it throws the spores out here it appears this boy is playing mischief and it is uh, just uh, pulling the wall towards it and then it shows it is like a slingshot of a catapult and these spores are not spores but these are bombs and how the pteridophyte is fighting for its existence and i quote here albert einstein once we accept our limits we go beyond them we say that this is a final story but next time as some new facts come before us and we have to change our phylogenetic story our knowledge about the living and fossil pteridophytes is day by day increasing and this is a very interesting topic for the research and i uh, request all the audience who are learning this to enjoy the literature on the fossil pteridophytes and living pteridophytes i have introduced you with the realm of the living pteridophytes and then i try to summarize the fossil history of uh, pteridophytes and i hope you must have enjoyed this story thank you very much dr padrip thank you very much for your amazing lecture really very good i learned it a lot okay here okay. in paleobot video yes here in paleobot video always good lectures here and sincerely i like it your lecture very very good lecture thank you thank you oh, very much yes yes dr padrip i have some questions okay yeah. i have i think six questions uh to ask you but yeah. <laughs> listen my english as you know is not good i don't know if you will understand me but i want to ask you uh, yeah. Padrip, I would you like to know, uh, for example, if the ferns, pteridophyte in general, uh, have uh, cyclocytic stomachs? I, I, I don't know. I think only gymnosperm, but I am not sure. Cyclocytic stomachs is, are present in, in ferns, in, in pteridophyte, Actually, in fossil pteridophytes, in fossil pteridophytes, we do not get a, a very strong cuticle, and so cynocytic stomata are, are reported in some form. And as far as the diversity of pteridophytes is concerned, there are uh, approximately fifteen thousand, fifteen k uh, species have been reported in the living uh, pteridophytes. Fifteen k species have been reported, and the uh, fossil pteridophytes their cuticles has not been well reported it is not very strong and 
it is a chance that we can get the endromical decay. Okay, okay. So let let me see if I understand the English. <laughs> One minute. So uh, is present in fairness and in pteridophytes in general, cyclocytic stomatis in the past. Is it or, or not? I understand correctly? No, I have not come across. Okay. Such type of stomatis. Okay, okay. Uh, Lisa, I would you like to ask one thing. Uh, there is any any answer? Sorry, there. Uh, yes, there is. Is there any answer uh, about the reduction of the leaves? Uh, of leaves? Carbonifer, Von, um, why were pteridophytes reduced after carbonifer? After carboniferous? No, yes. they are. Why, 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 redu why, why the, the leaves were reduced after carbonifer? I, might mean, I have already told that pteridophytes grow in moist and shady habitat. Carboniferous was a time which was having wet habitat. And they were cold swamp. They were swampy areas, and they produce cold swamp flora. But in during Triassic period, the habitat became drier. During Triassic period, habitat became drier, and all the big pteridophytes they became short. As I have quoted, Isoites is known from there, and you can see Pleuromaya is also known from the Triassic. They became smaller, and the pteridophytes became confined to the peripheral areas of the water bodies. Okay, okay. So that part, that uh, is to, uh, that history is not very rich. In Mesozoic, we do not get much pteridophytes. Actually, in Mesozoic, cycadophytes became dominant. Cycadophytes means cycads and uh, benetitals, member, gymnospermous plants, they dominated the flora. Pteridophytes okay. became reduced. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, could you say... Um, what interfere in the morphology of the pteridophytes leaves? Uh, some, uh, some things uh, in the paleo environment. Uh, could you say some things that can interfere in the pteridophytes leaves? Leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could get your question that what type of habitat they lived in. Okay? Yeah. Actually, during the Devonian time, they were growing in the marshy places. Okay? Like uh, Rhinia, Coxonia, they were growing in the marshy places. There are many uh, other localities like Gilboa Forest and Chinese locality and Svalbard locality. They show also show the habitat near the water bodies uh, in the coastal areas. And then when we come to Lepidodendropsis or uh, you come to cold swam flora of Carboniferous, at that time, water was abundant. The drawback of pteridophyte is that without water, their fertilization cannot occur. Without water, they cannot make their fertilization. That's why they have not become so much successful as gymnosperms and angiosperms have become successful. But even in the present day scenario, pteridophytes are doing well and they are doing well in the temperate climate and shady habitats. They are doing well where water is available for the act of fertilization. They cannot go in the desert area. I have been to the third desert of Rajasthan in India, and I could not see even a single pteridophyte. So they don't grow in the dry habitat. They grow only the shady and moist habitat. Okay, okay. Dr. Padrip, uh, in general, people say that vascular plants, pteridophytes in general, uh, come from Silurian, but uh, you believe that it come before Silurian? Actually, before Silurian, we don't get any mega fossil. Before Silurian, during uh, Ordovician and Cambrian, Cambrian and Ordovician, we get only the spores of bryophytes and pteridophytes. It is very difficult to differentiate the spores of bryophytes and pteridophytes. Okay, we do not get any mega fossil during Cam Cambrian and uh, Ordovician ages. And the oldest record of pteridophytes begins from Coxonia, from the late Silurian onward. Okay, okay. Uh, 
one more more to question here. Mm. Um, some uh, some autos, some autos. No, in in general, autos says that uh, first no vascular plant occupied yeah. land. Okay, in in, in general, yeah, yeah. autos say it, but some time ago. I, I read a paper that was discussing about it, and maybe, maybe, vascular plant occupied land first than a vascular, to prepare the soils, these things. What do you think about it? Do you believe that no vascular Actually, plant occupied... Yeah, yeah, no vascular soil? plant means, no vascular plant refer to bryophytes and algae. Algae appeared during the Precambrian time and at, in the beginning, blue-green algae came into existence during the middle Precambrian and like the, there are many genera and then came green algae, Glenobotridion, that is the earliest green alga and they were all growing in water. When we talk about bryophytes, which are the land plants, but they are not having xylem and phloem. So we get the fossil record of bryophyte only from the Devonian. That is uh, Hepatocytes demonicus is the earliest bryophyte, which is non-vascular. And before that, we get a lot of algae during the Precambrian time and others. So, as far as non-vascular plants are concerned, bryophytic bryophytes are very delicate plants. Their preservation has not occurred in the fossil record, and that's why there is discrepancy. They must have come before pteridophytes, be before Silurian, but we do not get any bryophyte which is next uh, primitive to pteridophyte, we don't get them. We get the first bryophyte, non-vascular land plant, that is from the Devonian Valley. That is Pala vicinitis Devonicus. Okay, okay. So, one more, one more question here. Uh, I know Birbal Sun Institute is a place that many fossils are preserved, are kept there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, are, are there other, other places in India that we can find fossilized okay. plants? I will tell you, in India, there were two main centers of paleobotany. One was the Birbal Science Institute of Paleobotany, now renamed as Paleo Sciences, Birbal Science Institute of Paleo Sciences. And the second was Allahabad University, where Professor D.D. Pan's school was working. And other centers were Pune and uh, Calcutta. But now all these centers have uh, declined. And uh, after the demise of Professor D.D. Pan, our school got a very uh, serious setback. And people shifted to other branches of botany, generally to gymnosperms. pumps. Okay, I myself is now working on in the area of cycads and uh, Dr. Manju Banerjee of Calcutta is no more. And Professor S.D. Bonde from Pune has done tremendous work on the fossil palm. He's doing very good work there. And uh, these are the four centers. Professor Mahabale was also working at MACS Pune. So these were the four places and two were very prominent, Lucknow and Allahabad. But presently, Birbal Sani Institute is taking lead because other centers have declined. Okay, okay. And in Alabahad University, uh, do you have any collection of these things? Yes, we do have. Professor Pant collection is residing here. Whatever work Professor Pant and his associates, his students have done, that is kept in Alabad University Museum. Yes, we do have. Yes, we do have Professor Pan collection here. Okay, okay, okay. So, let me see if there is any person that you want to ask more thing. I think I have one more question here. One yeah. minute. Because some people uh, are, uh, are with difficulty uh, to, to type in here. I don't know why. But one minute, one people, one, one person want to ask you. One minute. Wait, some, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting. One minute. 
here. So you you mention good accumulated species. Are companies using it in mineral exploration? Please repeat your question. I will uh, go. Uh, one minute. You mention uh, gold accumulated species. Yeah. Are companies using it in mineral exploration? Mineral exploration. No, whatever we get, we get in two states. Either it is in form of compression. Uh, from the coal field areas, we, from West Bengal and uh, Odisha, we collect the compressions of various pteridophytes. And there, an, a limited uh, details of anatomy can be worked out. And there are many localities, including Kashmir Himalayas, where I got only the impressions. And uh, there is no compression or petrifaction of this. In India, we get only compression or impression. No petrifaction. Okay. Dr. Padrip, uh, are there rules in India to protect these fossils in India? Yeah, yeah. There are some fossil uh, parts in India, in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, we are having some and uh, their forest department is uh, protecting them. And uh, these fossil parts are under the custody of forest department. One of my friends whose photograph I had shown, uh, he has uh, built a guest house also there and one can go and collect, for, uh, study the fossils there. Bebal Sani Institute is also al already working in that area. There is one more Salkhan fossil forest that is uh, in uh, uh, hilly areas and there we get uh, stromatolite. Mukun Sharma, my close friend, had just uh, recently visited that area. Okay, okay. Listen, is possible in India sell fossils? Is possible? In, in, in Brazil, it is not allowed. In India, is allowed to sell fossils or not? No, no, it is not allowed. You, you cannot take it to your country. You can just do go there, collect and research on them. Okay, okay. Is, here, here in Brazil, is the same. In European, no. In European, people can sell. No, no. In India, it is banned. It is the it is the property of forest department, and you cannot uh, take it out. They are they are having guards there in the fossil pass, and they don't allow you to take these fossils. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. Are 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 there many students interested in paleobotany in India, or they don't like? Uh, in general, here in Brazil, few students like paleobotany, these things. And in India, it is different. Actually, in India, the interest in the fossil botany is declining. Because uh, now the modern trend has come. People like to work in biotechnology or uh, biochemistry, phytochemistry or other advanced field. And people are not much interested in paleobotany. Now, it has become uh, old fashioned branch here and therefore students do not take earlier during my time meritorious students used to opt paleobotany as their special paper in their msc pg study but now it is uh, not so the trend has changed now people opt for biotechnology we, they yeah. are crazy for biotechnology Yes, but the, the, the government in India invest uh, good money in paleobotany in these studies or not? Here in Brazil, no, very difficult. Uh, we get money to study paleobotany, paleontology, these things. And in India, it is easier or more difficult? Actually, pale paleontology is uh, applied and people get job in uh, Oil and Natural Gas Commission in India. So it is flourishing. But uh, as such, on the whole, paleobotany is reclining. And I might uh, quote the names of fossil parks you were asking. Bhugua Fossil Park, Madhya Pradesh, Salkhan Fossil Park, Uttar Pradesh, Akal Fossil Park, Rajasthan. There are so many parks and I myself have visited these parks. They are attractive. It, they People go there for uh, amusement or just as a uh, seeing the objects of wonder. But when you say that you do work, because these researchers are very difficult. You might have seen, you yourself have worked in the field of paleobotany. It takes a lot of time to collect the fossil specimen in the field. 
now people do not want to do so much labor they want to sit in the laboratory and do the phytochemistry or biotechnology study so now the craze has gone okay 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 so people any question no so dr padrip we will finish now uh thank you okay. very much again thank for you. your thank you thank you very much here and uh as i told you before this presentation uh, was recorded and after i will share it in, in a social net okay facebook okay, okay. thank you thank you okay. very much so thank, thank you. you very much you and uh okay, okay. good night in india i think good night in india and good night good night in india good night <laughs> okay, okay okay please When Thank I you. turn off, you continue in here because I want to talk you after finish here, okay? So, okay, okay. So bye, Thank bye, you. everybody. Thank bye. you very much for everybody here. Bye. bye. I think end, end broadcast.